praise for your thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord. I praise you and thank you for your goodness, your mercy, your grace, your spirit, the spirit. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We need you. I praise you today. Lord, help me to speak what it is that you're saying to your church, your body today, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This morning's message is going to be uh, entitled Witnessing, but I'm going to get carried off into about 15 other things as I go along here. I was sitting here the other week, uh, this past weekend, as you were, I was over in a place called McConnellsburg, just over the mountain. And I had a gospel table set up with uh, Bibles, tracts, free books, etc. You know, just to encourage people, pray for people. I couldn't tell you how many people I prayed for. Many, many people. Uh, there was a lady there who had asked the other day if I would pray for her friend. Her friend would had chronic pain. And so uh, I said, oh, absolutely. You know, I prayed with that woman, but I prayed in the spirit, not, not in tongues, but in the spirit. And if you don't understand that, well, then um, it's just really a difficult thing to try to explain because I was in the spirit praying. I wasn't just praying in tongues. It was a, a, a place, a depth, a depth of uh, in the Holy Ghost. And... Uh, so I prayed for her friend. I prayed for her nephew. And then yesterday afternoon when I was over closing the stand-up, I talked to the lady a little bit, and she said that she had talked with her friend, and her friend is completely pain-free now. But it's the work of Jesus. It's what Jesus is doing. You know, it says be an instant in season and out of season, and that we are to be prepared there's a hurting and dying world out there around you, you know. And as um, I want to continue on with that thought, you know, a friend of mine and his wife, they stopped up and they were sitting at the table with us. And there was a reality that came to me. And, and what I'm about to say, I am not finding fault whatsoever. I am not finding fault. But it was a reality that came, it was made real to me. She was asking people, do you know Jesus? And I'm telling you what, I must have asked that question a hundred thousand times myself to people. When I would go witnessing door to door or wherever I was at, I'd ask them, do you know Jesus as your Savior or do you know Jesus? And when she was, but there was a reality that came to me that the people who are lost, who were never brought up in, in church, they have no concept of why they need Jesus. They have no concept that without him, they are not going to heaven. They have no concept of an eternal life. And so, even though I all have also used that phrase, do you know Jesus, I'm second thinking this. Is our approach right? Christendom has used that approach for a long time. Do you know Christ as your Savior? And many people blatantly say, yeah, I do, and then they keep go about their way, and they have no concept of what they're even talking about. The question is, is do we, we know what we're talking about. How do you convey to a lost and dying world that they are on their way to hell and the only one that can save them is Jesus. How do you convey that? How do you convey that for them to understand? How do you convey that? How, do you, how does it, what does it take? You know, yeah, it, it obviously starts with prayer and you can pray for people. Um, we have an evangelist that comes here often, Joan Pierce. And uh, her and her husband, they're out of Florida. They go all over the United States and all over the world, in fact. And she has a very powerful testimony of how she came to Christ. She was, in her younger years, uh, illiterate, couldn't read. She walked the streets. She made her money doing those things. And uh, I'm not going to delve into her testimony. That's for her to give. And she has given it. But there was a lady across the road that would continually bring her over different Bibles. And she's like, well, you know, I don't really understand that version. So the lady would go and bring her a different version. The whole time, Joan couldn't read. 
And finally, after this lady brought her over about five different versions of the Bible, Joan blew up on her one day, threw the Bibles at her as she was leaving the front door, throwing Bibles. Joan was in their house throwing Bibles at her and yelling at her and said, and, and beyond that, I can't even read it anyway, so you just quit wasting your time and quit bringing these Bibles to me. And So then the lady brought her over the Bible on cassette. <laughs> And Joan eventually came to know Christ as her Savior. So what's our excuses? What are we doing? You know, a lot of these people that if we just come straight up and say, do you know Jesus is your Savior? What are, you, what are we saying to them? And do they understand the implication? They need to know that they are lost and undone. They need to know that without Jesus as our sacrifice, that all of us are hell-bound. That without Christ, without the shedding of His blood, none of us have any hope of eternity in heaven. Not one of us. I was reminded, I was talking to a minister this morning, I was sharing with him, you know, of, of a very good friend of mine who I met in the glass industry, in marbles specifically, he was out of uh, Jacksonville, Florida. His name was uh, Alan Bassinet. He has passed away. And um, I made very good friends with him. He loved his marijuana. He loved his pet raccoon. We'd dig into his bag of weed and eat the buds all the time. <clears throat> so he had to be careful where he kept his stash. And so uh, I first met Alan in the, the marble community, buying, selling marbles, trading, willing, dealing. Met him at the, one of the shows we go to. We've been to uh, Columbus, Ohio, all the way to Marlboro, Massachusetts, places all over the West Virginias, uh, all over the East Coast, essentially. And so anyway, I met Alan, and uh, be, uh, we became friends. And, um, and I don't really ever recall preaching at him. But uh, as time went on, and he wasn't, a, he was a very intelligent man. He was a uh, forensic anthropologist at one time before he decided he wanted to go full time buying, willing, and dealing and selling because he made good money doing that. And he had the liberties of his drug use or whatever. So one day out of the blue on his uh, webpage, he had a, a chat room and he said, on an open forum, he said, What does it mean to be saved? And the religious elite came out of nowhere, and they were gnashing on each other violently, openly. People who were diehard Catholics, people who were diehard Baptists, and people who were diehard whatever they were, and they were gnashing on each other violently that I'm right and you're wrong, and this is that and that is this. It, it, it was so repulsive. It was so repulsive that I almost left that entire page, not permanently, but just for that, because I didn't want to be tangled up in that mess. But Alan sent me a message. He said, hey, Ray, come on over here to this private chat room. So I did. And it was just me, him, and some lesbian friend of ours that was in that chat room. He said, what's the truth? I said, Alan, I said, there is nobody good enough to get to heaven. No one. And God saw that. And so he sent his son to straighten this mess out, but they killed him. Three days later, he rose again from the dead. And as you call on him and ask him to forgive you of everything you've done wrong, and you mean it, you can have an assurance of it being with him. Two weeks later, the man was dead, multi-organ stage four cancer that nobody really knew about, but his girlfriend told us it after the fact. We're dealing with <clears throat> a lost and dying world out here. People who have never been brought up in the church, people who are not churchified, Christianified, wordified. They don't know all this lingo, jing, jingle, jangle, the Christian lingo. They don't understand all this stuff. They don't get it. 
If you come at them with all this religious religiosity, they they ain't gonna they're not gonna understand what you're talking about. So what is your witness? What are you doing? My wife and I were heading over to close up the stand yesterday, a little gospel stand in McConnellsburg. We were traveling through a town called Chambersburg, which is east of here, west of here. And uh, as we were going through town, I saw an old man with a walker who had fallen off the curb. And there was a young lady trying to help him. I circled the block and I came back, put the van four-way flashers on, pulled, stayed back far enough. I walked up to try to help this man. We called EMS because it was just too difficult to get him up. I just called EMS for them to come and get him up. Of all the cars that passed by, no one stopped. There were people walking by on the sidewalks. No one stopped. There was a man with his phone in his hand as he walked by. Wouldn't even look at us. So I stood there. The man was in a sitting position. And he was struggling to stay seated upright. So I put my leg up behind his back and I said, It's okay, man. Lay back against my leg. It'll be okay. I prayed with him. Finally, EMS comes along. They scoop him up and I take off. Where's the love of Christ? Where's the love of Christ? All the people that drove by, all the people that walked by, where's the love of Christ in them? Don't they care? Those of you that profess to be Christians and yet you want to fight with your neighbor all the time, Where's the love of Christ? Why don't you suffer the wrong? Why don't you just suffer the wrong and put up with it and show that person some compassion and love? Where's the love of Christ? There's more to witnessing than just running around shoving the Bible down somebody's throat. Yes, they need to hear the word. They need to hear that they're going to hell. They need to know that. They need to know that there is a way out of going to hell. They need to know that. But there's more to your witness. There's more to your story. There's more. That your relationship with Christ has got to come out of you. It's got to reflect from you. People have got to see Christ in you. There were two ladies that were sat next to us over in this, uh, over in McConnellsburg. There's been many people that I prayed for over there. I couldn't tell you how many people I prayed with, prayed for different things, this, that, and the other thing, cancers, and I don't know what all I didn't pray for. But these two ladies that were beside us, they had a stand. They knew what my stand was. They knew that I was giving tracts out, Bibles out, literature, books that the pastor Yeager had written, uh, Pastor uh, Dave Fern that he had written. I have books of his that I was given away. Just all kinds of stuff. Coins, you know, Christian coins with uh, Christ on one side, uh, the uh, Last Supper on the other, the coins with uh, the whole armor of God uh, on it, just, uh, just giving everything away. Just everything's free, you know, and just sharing Christ. And they knew what my stand was. They knew what I was about. I didn't push Jesus on them people. I didn't. The lady was involved in jewelry. I saw she had a three-strand, what they call mystery braid. It was in leather. I said, do you know anything about a five-strand mystery braid? She's like, no. I said, if you bring one in, I'll bring some leather in, I'll show you how to do that. And I shared with her some other ideas, how to tie a Turk's head knot, how it could be used in a bracelet or in a hair tie. That's what they were involved in. 
And as we packed up, my wife said, as I put the last things in the van, my wife said, you know, that lady in there wants you to go in there and pray for her. I said, really? So I go in there. And she asked if I would pray for her husband who had rheumatoid arthritis in both hands. And with the love of Christ, with compassion, I took her by the hand and I prayed over her for her husband that he that God would heal him of that arthritis. The woman was crying. She gave me a hug. Some people know they need Jesus. Your testimony, your witness is more than just beating somebody over the head with the religious do's and don'ts. Are you acting in love? How does it all come together? A lot of times it's obedience to the Spirit. A lot of times it's obedience to what the Lord is saying to your heart. Not everybody's in the same place. Not everybody is going to have the same understanding. And you need to be sensitive to how the Lord is having you reach out to your neighbor or those around you. I believe in the Roman road. I believe in telling people about the Roman road. It's a very good set. Look it up in the internet. You can find it printed it off by bookmarkers or whatever you want to do. Write it on the inside of your Bible. That way you have easy access to it. I highly recommend that you do that. Because it helps you to be able to share with people that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But God has made a way through His Son, Jesus. The lost need to know why they need a Savior. It's the love that's God that's going to keep that anybody. A lot of religious people will beat you over the head violently until you give up, until you lose all hope. And then they'll call you a backslider or they'll call you all kinds of names. Or they'll say that you're reprobate. Not seeing that it the reality that it was them beating you over the head that drove you away from the church. We have to be careful. You know, Jesus, when he spoke, he said that, Woe unto you who scatter the sheep. It would be better for you to have a millstone hung around your neck and cast into the sea than for you to hurt one of these little ones of mine. He's talking to the ministers. He's talking to the so-called Christian who is a religious know-it-all and is malicious with their words. Do you need to continually grind on somebody? Paul said, I'll become all things to all men, that I may win some. Many years ago, when even before I came to Christ in full surrender, I was serving the devil, serving him hard. I was in the foundry working. I'd have a cigarette in one hand and a chew of the back end in my mouth, and just, man, I was all that in a bag of chips and still drunk from the night before as I was working. Not proud of that. But as I was in that state and in that mind frame, something just kind of told me that I needed to go back and talk to this one man who worked in the one molding machine. And so as I went back to talk to him, I'm pretty sure he said something to me about Jesus. But I have never, I never remembered a any other anything that came out of his mouth i don't know what he said to this day i there's no i don't know what the man said but this much i know is i walked away i remember saying inside of my head 
I don't know what that man has, but that is what I need. It wasn't until later I found out he was filled with the Holy Ghost. It was the presence of God around him. It was the presence of God that was dealing with me. It was the Holy Ghost that was dealing with me, showing me a better life, a better way. It was that crazy missing part. He had what I lacked. He had what I needed. He had the Spirit of God. And I'm telling you, I don't remember what the man talked to me about. Not one word. I think he said something about Jesus, but I, I, I don't know. I just remember whatever he had, that's what I needed. I'm talking to you about laying aside your religious thinking. Lay aside your spiritual fears. I've sat down on the floor with Satanist in a hotel in the hallway right across from each other. Talking to him about Jesus. Why he needed Jesus. I encountered a man one time who, when I asked if he knew Christ, he said, no. I said, okay. He said, I'm a pagan. And I asked him, why did you, what made you choose to go that route? And he said, I'll tell you the story. One time his grandfather had been going to a church and had been faithful to that church. Had been paying all kinds of money to that church all of his life. And when his grandfather was on his deathbed, my friend was there, and he said to him, Will you please go get that minister? I would like to have him pray for me one more time before I go. So my friend went out, hunted down this minister, and said, Pap would really want, love to have you go and pray over him one more time before he dies. And the minister said that it was going to cost him X amount of dollars. My friend looked at him and said, well then forget it. He went back to his grandfather and said, told him that he couldn't find that minister. And his grandfather died that day. So then this man's friends, other friends, they showed him love. They showed him compassion. Everything that he had need of, they met. They brought him in. They put their arms around him. They loved him. They were pagans. And so he picked up with what they get offered him. And I had a talk with him one day, and I said, you know, I am absolutely so sorry that that minister did that to you and your grandfather. I said, I am so sorry. I said, but please, you have to understand. That man, that minister, has no place in the kingdom of Christ. That minister is not going to make heaven his home. I said, so please. Please, will you, give, will you give the Lord a chance? Will you surrender your life to him? Give him a chance in your life. I gave him a tract, explaining a simple plan of salvation. And to this day, I still befriend that man. My point here today is, when it comes to witnessing, there's more to witnessing than just shoving verses at people and telling them how wrong they are. You have to be moving in the love of Christ, in the character, the nature, and the personality of God. He has got to be manifesting himself through you because if he is not manifesting himself through you, 
in love with all his attributes, then you're just nothing but a religious fuddy-duddy. There was a man that came to Jesus one day and he said, what's the greatest commandment of all? Jesus said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And he said, the second is just like unto it, to love your neighbor as yourself. He said, on these hinge all of the law and the prophets. Because if you love God, you're not going to go out here and worship idols. You will put him first if you love him. If you love your neighbor as yourself, you're not going to go over there and steal his things, which is, thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not have no other God before me. If you love your wife, you're not going to cheat on her by even looking at another woman. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Then you can go down through and you can pick the rest of them apart. Because if you truly are walking in love, you're going to make a difference. You're not going to commit any of the book. You're not going to willfully be committing these sins. The laws and the prophets hinge on the thing of love. I had a couple other notes written on my paper here that the Lord put in my heart this morning. And so... Not that it actually makes a whole lot to go with along with this witnessing theme and who you are and how you behave yourself, how you carry yourself and what you say, what you do. All those things all play into your witness and your testimony for whether or not somebody actually comes to Christ. At the end of the day, it's the Lord said it's not that any man um, should need to go around and say, believe in the Lord because all men will know that I am what he said because to every man has been given a measure of faith there's an empty spot in every person a missing part a crazy missing piece and there's only one that can fill it and his name is Jesus but back to this other the, a couple other thoughts that I had written here Are any of you watchmakers? Any hands? Any watchmakers? No. None of you. So then you're telling me you don't know how to even put a watch together with all the little gears and all that other stuff. You don't. You, you really have no concept. So you're not going to go into a watchmaker shop and try to tell him how to put the watch together then, are you? Well, it's what's really crazy in Christian when you're praying, you're trying to tell God how to fix things. That's crazy. And what the Lord would be saying is, don't be telling him how to do his job. I've seen it happen where people go to pray for somebody, and they lay hands on them, and they say, Lord, this muscle, this tendon, this muscle group here, and this and that, and open up the circulation to this and that. Don't, don't be praying like that. It's not necessary. If you want to pray for somebody, just lay your hand on them and say, in a general sense, Father, in the name of Jesus, or Father, will you take this out and fix that shoulder? Whatever you got to do, Lord, for your glory, in Jesus' name. There's times I've asked, and then there's times I've actually commanded soreness to uh, things to come out. I've, I've commanded bloody noses to stop bleeding, and they did. I've commanded sore muscles to, to, for the soreness to come out, and immediately it did. So we, there's times, you know, and it just depends on the person. It depends on how the Holy Ghost moves through me at the time. Sometimes I ask the Father to do the work in Jesus' name, and there's times that I command it to come out. Laying hands on the sick is part of a witness. It's part of a testimony. My neighbor had cancer. Of all things, he had breast cancer. He battled it for about a year with chemotherapy and radiation. Then he developed a lump on the other side.
There's been so many things that I've witnessed to this man. Unbeknownst to me, one winter as I'm blowing the snow and cleaning driveways, he was having a very bad day because of the chemo. He was physically wiped out even though he had gone to work that day. And him and his wife were crying and he said, I don't know, he goes, the driveway needs clean. He goes, I'm just going to have to deal with it when I get home. And though he was physically wiped completely out. I saw his driveway. I saw what for a mess it was. I realized that it was somewhat slush, slushy during the afternoon, but I knew that it was going to get cold that night and turn to a brick of block of ice. And though I was cold, wore out myself and tired, I went ahead over and I cleaned his driveway. When he got off of work and came home, him and his wife cried because physically he was completely spent and somebody cleaned his driveway for him. The same man discovered another tumor on the other side. He goes back to his doctor and it's all confirmed. And so one morning, here not too long ago, I go across the road and I talk to him. I said, Mike, may I pray for you? He said, yes. I take him by the hand and I ask, Father, in the name of Jesus, will you take all the cancer out of my heart? He goes back to the doctor and there's nothing there to be found. What is your witness? Your witness has got to be more than words. Your witness has got to be more than talk. Your witness has got to be so much more than beating somebody over the head with your Bible. If you are not reflecting the love of God through your life to others, then my friends, you're missing it. You're missing it. I think one of the greatest tragedies that I see happening, even with all the miracles that Jesus is doing, and I'm seeing many miracles, I'm seeing many people being healed of many illnesses, diseases, chronic conditions, cancers, broken bones being healed instantly, bloody noses, bloody this and this and that, many things, I'm seeing it, I'm seeing things firsthand, even spiritual things happening, people being set free. Many, many, many things were happening. And yet, only a few have gone and gotten involved in the church and they're turning their lives around. Yet I'm not going to stop praying for people. Jesus told us a story about the ten lepers. He healed ten of them. And only one came back and fell down before him. And Jesus said, didn't I not heal ten? Where are the other nine? There was a time when Jesus fed the multitude. There was 5,000 people there. Men that were counted. And, uh, Jesus fed them. A few loaves, a few fish, whatever. I forget the numbers. Five loaves, seven fish. Whatever it was, I don't remember. But Jesus fed him that. And he turned, and uh, at the end of the night, he turned to go up into the mount. And he was walked away, and he looked at the whole multitude, and he said to them, he said, you're not following me for the miracles. You're only following me because I gave you something to eat. So don't be surprised that you invest your life into trying to reach somebody you just do it out of love, whether they receive what you have to say or not. Just show them love. Show them the love of Christ. Give them the word when you can. But the most important thing of all is to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit as the Lord leads you. 
He sees exactly where that person is, what they have need of, whether they need to have the word beat over their head, or whether they need to be taken by the hand and saying, I cannot understand what agony you're going through, but I'm here for you. I will sit with you. If you would like some warm tea, I'll bring you warm tea. I don't have the words to say for you I don't, or to help you. I don't have those words, but I'm here for you. It's all part of your witness. It's all part of your testimony. I want to encourage you today. Continue to walk in the love of Christ. Some may say that this person or that person, you don't understand, Brother Ray. They are the most miserable, and I can't deal with them, and I can't even think of anything to say to them, and they make me so cringe because of how miserable they are. They're always in the molly grubs. They're always down and out, and they bring me down. I get it. But I'm, gonna tell, I'm just going to encourage you to just be there for them and still show them the love of Christ. It's going to be part of your witness. The 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians is a very good chapter to read. I started out talking about witnessing and I ended up over at 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. Though I have not love, Though I speak with tongues of men and angels and have not love, I become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Though I give my body to be burned at the stake and have not love, it profits me nothing. Though I have everything in the world and I give it all away and I have not love, I gain nothing. By loving your neighbor, you're also witnessing to them. By showing them love, maybe they will listen to you when they wouldn't listen to anybody else. Let, you, let your witness be clean. Let your witness be good. Walk in the true love of Christ. Pray. Pray and ask the Lord to lead you into how to deal with people. Not everybody's going to be the same. Well, Father, I come to you in Jesus' name as I close this message this morning. I have delivered those things that you've laid on my heart. May I ever be found true. that others may know that you are alive, that you are in me. It's not me, but you. Father, I pray for those that have heard this message that are listening and will listen, either here or in the cyber world, that they would move in that spirit of love, that they would consider what they're saying, that they would consider The brow beating is not going to get the job done. But that you would manifest yourself through them, that they would see Christ in them as they go about with their witness. That I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>